Well, good morning, church family. How's everyone doing? Yeah. Amen. It's always this section right here every time. They, nice and loud. No. Uh, I'm very excited to be with you guys. Uh, as Pastor Jordan said, which I'm very thankful for, Pastor Jordan and the influence that he has. It's, a, it's really fun. You guys met Pastor Daniel last week um, when him and Pastor Jordan came on. It was really cool to have the connection of all of us married nurses. Um, and so we are smart men, and so uh, our wives are smarter, and uh, we're thankful for that. But uh, I also do like a church that lets us as youth pastors get up back to back and get to wear our suits. So we get to uh, dress to impress once in a while. Um, but in this, in this series, I want to do just a quick review because it's always so helpful, especially uh, first-time guests, people popping in and out. We always got to try and get caught up a little bit. And so... Uh, Pastor Daniel hit right when uh, Peter and the, and the Christians were, came back to Jerusalem and had this council because they were starting to have some discrepancies and some people were walking in and uh, kind of saying some things that were just a little off. And so Pastor Daniel had two points that really consolidated that whole entire passage in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. Um, and it's that everyone needs the gospel. That's a great thought. And it's a, it's a beautiful truth. And that honestly could be the whole message. But it can go further, and, and, and I love that he then brought it, and he said the gospel is available to everybody. Um, Pastor Aaron has done a great job showing us through the book of Acts and even t- giving us some history lessons in the Old Testament about how the gospel had been affecting people, uh, not just Israel, but even just Gentiles and sojourners ever since the Old Testament. But there's something special about this movement now here at Acts where we see it being hyper-intentional. We see, we see this, this massive command to then go and bring it to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people. And uh, so we, we see that Peter is talking to these people, and he makes two massive statements. Because right before this part, I love this analogy, and it might just be because I'm a youth guy, um, but he sees the vision with the giant blanket, right? And it's just all these different types of meat. And we always call it the piggy in the blanket vision, right? And you see, he sees the piggy in the blankets coming down, and God's using this to show Peter that the gospel and salvation and all these things are for everyone, That God's love was for the whole world. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, right? And so uh, he he goes back to this council and and he he reminds them of a very sweet thing, that God knows our hearts. It's a very scary thought, but it's a very beautiful thought to think, right? God already knows. And I love that then he goes on to say, because God knows our hearts and still chooses to love us, The only way that we can ever experience salvation isn't by going, and as Pastor Aaron says, right, the uh, ain't no party like a circumcision party, right? That was the whole beef that they were having of if you want to really be saved, you got to go follow some of these rites and rituals. And Peter says, no, it's by grace through faith. It always has been, it always will be by grace through faith. Um, and, and I love this, this thought that we're seeing here in Acts. Now that the church has formed, now that the, the local church and the, and the body of Christ is really taking formation, and they're now moving, right? They're now pushing forward. They're now spreading from Jerusalem to Antioch to all these different places that they're going around. Um, this massive thought, and it's going to sound big for a second, and, and I want to bring it down, is that proper doctrine leads to proper doxology or, or right knowing leads to right living, right? If we know what to do, we can do the job a lot better, right? And for all of us men, it's usually after we've tried to do it without the instructions, correct? I do it every time when I had to build my son's crib. Got everything put into place, it was upside down. Don't know how I did it. I blame stress of almost having a kid at that point. Um, But then when I read the instructions, it made perfect sense. When I understood what I had to do, I could get the job done. So when we as believers and when we as people seeking for that eternal, when we actually understand what's going on and what's taking place, we're able to then pursue it, rediscover it, and and get back on track. And so um, the best way I can really equate to this, and, and I did this just a little bit so I could brag on my boy, um, but, but Psalms 139 in verses 13 through 16, for a lot of us, we might know this passage, but if you don't, it's that passage where it says, I've knitted you in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And as a pastor, I can tell you that verse. I can tell you that there's truth in it. I can tell you that it is beautiful, that every single person in this room, no matter how you look, no matter how you might be feeling, God made you and designed you that way. 
that God made you a man or a woman, that God allowed you to get some gray hair or lose it or keep it, that God, God designed all of these things. And, and you see, um, at first, Levi was just a, a bump, right? My wife, we, we, we did really bad on the bump pictures. We, we got a couple maybe at like Christmas, and that was it. And, and Levi to her was very special, right? Because she's, she's experiencing the knitting. She's experiencing the creation of life. But me as the father, I'm just like, like, hey, buddy, <laughs> putting on some good sermons up on the belly, right? Get him, get him started young. He became a little bit more clear when, I, it's, I guess it's a newer thing that you can now do, but I, I have a picture of a, of a 4D ultrasound of, of little Levi. Um, and, and it was in this moment when I saw these ultrasounds, and we started doing these ultrasounds, that Levi became a lot more real to me. Right? I, can, I, I picked the one where he's smiling. Most of them, he looks grumpy already. He, <laughs> my wife says he got that from me. So. But, but he's smiling there, and, and, and it was like, oh. Be still my heart. We got the little stuffed animal that they put the heartbeat in, right? And they gave you the ultrasound and all that. Um, but it wasn't until April 2nd at 2.56 p.m. Um, that this amazing bundle of joy, who's now two and a half months old, if you want to put up his next picture, um, this, this little man right here, Levi, uh, changed my life forever. I thought my life was changed when I found out that my wife was pregnant. I thought my life was changed when I saw that ultrasound. Um, that this scripture right here, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that God knitted you in your mother's never became more real the moment little Levi was born at 2.56 p.m. on April 2nd. And now every day from there, I get to realize how much we are born sinners. <laughs> how much I really lack in grace, and how really good our God is. But this is, I wanted us to see, hey, because I, I like looking at my boy. He'll be here next service. But I think it's healthy for us to, to understand this thought process because this is exactly where the church in Jerusalem and Antioch are starting to find themselves. They were understanding the grace and the faith and Christ and Scripture and the glory of God. They were understanding all these pieces, but it wasn't until they started experiencing the persecution and the life together as believers that it became real. And there's a lot of us in this room this morning that we've had that moment, and we gave our life to King Jesus because it became real to us. And there's some of us in this room this morning that you're right there. You're right there trying to figure out what in the world is taking place in my heart. And it was just as Peter did. Peter, right up before this whole council in, in, in the book of Acts, was still trying to figure out who the gospel was meant for, who it was to go to. And then when this vision was given to him, it busted the doors wide open for Peter to understand, oh, <laughs> this makes so much sense. I can have piggies in a blanket, All right? And so if you'll jump in with me in Acts chapter 15, we're going to start off in verse 22. It starts off with this. And so they have the council. Um, they've made it very clear that God knows our hearts and that we are saved by grace through faith. So those two massive points, we then jump in and it says, Then it seems good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church that choose men from among them to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers. With the following letter, and this is what it said, it said, The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicilia, greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instruction. And as we see already here in the opening of their letter, that this, this church was doing, it, it, it was not an act of human means alone to see that the church was now developing in Antioch. The fact that Gentiles were now being pursued with the gospel. And not only that, the church in Antioch was sending relief to the church in Jerusalem, headquarters. See, here's, here's the beauty of, of the movement of the local church was so powerful. It was saving both these people. It was causing Satan and our sin to attack in more devious ways. 
See, when the actions of God are powerful, the snares of Satan are prowling all around. When God is working, Satan is running up behind just trying to figure out what he can do to foil it. It wasn't by accident that they put in the letter, we have given them no instruction. Because there were people from amongst the group who held the title and, and took the label and then went out and were saying, hey, you have to be circumcised. Hey, you have to follow these rites and rituals and traditions or else you won't be saved. Trying to do it all under the banner of the local church. See, when, when God is working in the church, when God is moving, Satan's always prowling. And I think sometimes we always look for the outside in. But when God's working so powerfully and so quickly and so organically, it can sometimes happen from the inside out. And so the first reaction to those who are sound in the word and in the faith was to be what? They were unified. See, when, when God is working in his church, when God is moving in his local church, especially this church that's now on the move, the first step that the leadership of the church did is they pushed down the beautiful reality of what they called unity. They, Peter and them could have easily just made a decision on their own and said, this is final word, this is final say, go take it back, let us know what takes place in like two or three weeks. But what does the opening part in verse 22 says? It, says? it seemed good to the apostles, the elders, and then the whole church. It's a lot of people giving their say. See, even back then in, in the Bible times, it's always better to make group decisions than to make a siloed decision. Because when God is working and people are aware it makes it a lot harder for those who are trying to be unaware, stay gullible to it. God's moving. God's working. And so when people push against it, they're going to be revealed because those who are in the truth are unified. It said the apostles, the elders, and the whole church. It goes on to say in the letter, it says, it has seemed good to us, having one accord, there's the unity again, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved uh, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this. They, they didn't just seek for the unity. They also, they also sought wise counsel. And not only did they seek the wise counsel to write the letter and then just send it off with any Joe Schmo. They said, we want to we send this letter that is representative of our word and of our body of Christ with our best people. But what made them the best people? It wasn't their eloquence. It wasn't the fact that they looked somewhat decent in a sports coat and jeans. Thank you. <laughs> it was verse 26 where it says men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when it comes to defending the unity of the church and her message, we must understand that unity is found in the presence of God. If I'd walked and talked to every single one of you, I'm gonna, I can find out what you're passionate about. If you talk to Pastor Daniel, it doesn't take too long to find out that he's a UK fan. Even when I walk by his office door when it's closed, the blue lights are still on. His car has the massive decal, right? He is passionate. You'll also understand very quickly, I know nothing about college sports because I'm not passionate about it. Sometimes I want to be, and then I just get confused. <laughs> but there are those who they find camaraderie in those things, right? It's super easy to get, to, to get on fire for something when there's more people getting on fire about it too, right? So if the church in Jerusalem, if, if all they were passionate about was making sure that Peter looked really good and they were passionate about Peter, well, then it was just a fan club for the apostle Peter. But it said that they risked their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. What makes us different than any other assembly that meets on a weekly basis. 
What makes us different is that we believe some things. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for us, rose again, and paid the penalty of sin so that the moment you and I place our faith in him alone, he gives us salvation. He forgives us of our sins, and he gives us new life. And it's on that message, on that rock, he built his church. And these men saw such reality. Later on, Paul would, would scribe out, right? To live is Christ, to die is gain. These men understood that mission. So much so that when the church was in need and when the church had to show its unity, they didn't send their most well-spoken, they didn't send the best-looking, they didn't send the most athletic, they sent the ones who risked all for Jesus. Those were the ones being sent out. In verse 27, it goes on and says, We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who they themselves will tell you the same thing by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Very nice brief, just farewell. But why is this so important to us? Well, I need us to just look back real quick at verse 21. Because in verse 21, it tells us that from, el, from ancient generations, Moses had been in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. What are they saying? Moses and the law were already being taught, and they were already being used to be a what? The law was used as a mirror, as a revealer as a schoolmaster to show these people that the promise God made all the way back in the garden that he would send a savior. Well, at first you need to know that you need saving, right? Have you ever read the law? You're going to find out real quick you can't stand up to it. We need someone who can. And that's what was going on. And so rather than trying to add to the burden of salvation, right? These people were coming into the church at Antioch going, hey... I know you're an adult, and normally this happens when you're eight days old. Got to, you know, we got to lighten the load a little bit. It's going to be painful, but that's the only way you're going to get saved. And so at the council in chapter 15, Peter already made the distinction. It's by what? Grace through faith. Not plus circumcision, right? By grace through faith. And so then you say, hey, but Pastor Mitch, it's now telling him in verses 29 to abstain from these things. You're 100% correct. But we are not talking about the beautiful gift of the gospel. We are now talking about a multicultural group of believers and unbelievers in the city of Antioch trying to figure out what it means to do life and to love each other, both the insider and the outsider. So in the letter that they wrote back, they said, hey, you are saved, and you have grace, and you have freedom, and you have forgiveness. That doesn't give you the right to just smear it in the face of those who are still trying to figure it out. So if that means that you don't eat your steak rare, there better be forgiveness for that one. No other way to eat steak. Don't eat your steak, right? Don't, don't eat the blood, right? Don't eat anything that's been strangled. Don't eat something that's been sacrificed to idols, even though Peter was just shown that all of it's clean. Why? Because if they can humble themselves to the point where they can say, hey, we are so strong in Christ that we are willing to make some substitutions in our daily walk to show you how much we love you as you come in as a, as a potential fellow brother. Right? There are liberties in our life that we now have in Christ. But do we use those liberties if it could make a brother stumble? No way. If I have a fellow believer who, or a fellow a friend who's, who's curious about church and, and he, I know he struggles, he's, a, he's an alcoholic, and, and I go, hey man, go meet me at Buffalo Wild Wings. And when he comes up, he meets me, and I'm just chugging down a beer. Am I committing a sin? No, not necessarily. 
but what I am doing is I'm causing a brother to stumble. I'm causing a brother to see as a weaker vessel that maybe his alcoholism isn't that big of a deal. Right? And so I would rather abstain from something that I know isn't bad or isn't a sin if by hopes it means it can get that person to the same gospel message that now gives me freedom. So hear us very clear. We're not saying that he, he, that to add this to your gospel. The moment you give your life to King Jesus, you are what? You are justified. You are made right. Your price has been paid. You are eternally secure. You are his. But from that moment to the moment you get called home to glory, there's this very either sometimes long, sometimes short period of time that we like to call sanctification. It's where you're being set apart and every day you're being conformed to the image of Christ. I like to tell our, uh, our high school students this. Sanctification is pretty much uh, like spiritual puberty. It's very weird. A lot of times it's very uncomfortable, but we're growing. The voice gets deep, right? The muscles start to set in, right? But, but we're growing and you're going to stumble and you're going to fall, but you're never going to fall out. And you're never going to stumble away because you've been paid for. You're now just being conformed into his image. And so that's where he's getting at. But something else that's very important to understanding this is that we also have to understand that this church was trying to see something that was beyond human means. Did you notice in the letter, it said, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We have, we have some real talented, amazing people in our church. Most of you really are. Most of you can contribute something that I could never. I'm never going to be like these musicians up here. Pastor Aaron heard me sing this morning. He moved the seat over, right? <laughs> but we're giving glory to the God. It's a joyful noise, not a good one. We have a lot, and, and, but here's the thing about talent and, and, and a lot of our gifts that we can contribute with. They can be taught. They can be worked on. They can be grown. And we can build a really outwardly looking successful church. But what we want here at Indian Rocks and what we're trying to do long term is we don't want to just look wildly successful. We want people to look and say, how in the world is anything like that being accomplished? How is God doing those things through that church at Indian Rocks? You want to know how? Because of the Holy Spirit. We are asking God to do a work that can only be accomplished by the, and that can only be accomplished by something that brings us further than human talent and effort. The council at Jerusalem understood that they could easily have made the decision on their own, but it would never accomplish something far greater than what they could do on their own if they didn't have the Holy Spirit with them. It said it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And closing out in our, in our message this morning in, in the scripture, it says this in verse 30. It says, And so when they sent off, they went down to Antioch. And having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And verse 31, it's so beautiful. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. That should be us when we hear the word of the Lord read out loud or sung from the stage. We should be rejoicing because it's encouraging us. It might sting sometimes with conviction, but it's encouraging us. Verse 32, Judas and Silas, who they themselves, uh, they were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those um, that had sent them. And closing out, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. See, what happens when we are so unified around the presence of God and wanting to know him correctly, right? That's what this is really all. It's that proper doctrine leads to proper doxology, right living to, or right knowing to right living, right? What, what does this mean for us? What, what should this develop in us? Well, all of a sudden, sound teaching got brought into the church at Antioch, and what did people do? They rejoiced. They were stoked at the fact that there was encouragement in truth. 
that people were willing to call out the lies and the devious acts and stand up for what's first important, which is the gospel message. They didn't just come back and correct the wrongs and the sins, but they pressed in the truth. It'd be so easy. It's so easy to do life where all we ever do is point out each other's sin and then run away, expecting someone else to fix it for them. It'd be so easy if Pastor Aaron and myself and the others who stood up here on a Sunday morning just convicted you and called you out and said, you all are sinners, and then just walked back off. We've technically done our job, but there's something special about the same man who stood up here and brought conviction onto your life on a Sunday morning, who then walks with you on a Monday afternoon, who then pushes you into a uh, life group, Bible study group, care group, who then pushes you into a service to where you can actually partner with people and help greet who's showing you, hey, the gospel brings you into the family. We now get to sit together and experience what that family looks like. We wanna walk with you. We wanna be with you. We wanna experience life with you. There's a lot of us in this room this morning who family doesn't exist. Loneliness is our biggest battle. And what a more beautiful place could you find than this? where people from every race, every nation, every tongue have come together to find something greater than themselves. To sit and understand who Christ Jesus is. I love the fact that, man, Paul and Barnabas could have just kept going, right? They're the A team. They're usually the ones that you're like, yeah, we, they probably paid them a lot of good money to come preach on a Sunday morning, and then they got them out, and now we got the, the mid-range guy again. Paul and Barnabas stayed even Judas and Silas, they stayed until the congregation had peace and then they went back to go do their duties at their home church. And then Paul and Barnabas stayed and with others kept encouraging and growing and pushing forth. So what are some closing thoughts that we have for you guys as we sit and think about a church on the move that is experiencing God's presence? Well, first, we believe some things. If you have your fill in the blank, we believe some things. Right? If we don't believe some things, then we're just a bunch of people kind of sitting here doing a bunch of nothing, right? We've got to believe some things. It's, it's the gospel. It's of first importance. 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ Jesus died for our sins, right? He was then buried and rose again on the third day. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He is our salvation. It's by grace through faith, right? In Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, for God's glory alone. We as a body of believers have to believe some things, and when we have unity in those beliefs, it's a pretty powerful force for the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? So we gotta believe some things. But we also see that this church, they're committed to gospel community. They didn't wanna just be labeled another gathering, they didn't wanna be labeled another just group of people that are really good human activists. No, they were searching for something greater. They were searching to really shine the body of Christ Jesus. That's why we encourage people all the time on a Sunday morning, we'd love for you to sit one and serve one or sit one and study one. Man, what a better way to spend time with family than being able to sit under sound teaching together and then go do life together, whether it's by serving or doing a Bible study. This is the house of the Lord, amen? We gotta be committed to gospel community and encouraging new believers. A church on the move that seeks God's presence, we encourage new believers. We don't just try to get new believers in the door and then just leave you in the dust because we're still going forward. We wanna be like Paul and Barnabas where we sit back and we work with you. And, and I, I wanna throw up one last picture. Um, I, our, Levi's story is something crazy awesome. Um, but being a new dad, it was no greater privilege than have our pastors come in and just love on me as a new dad. See, that's what we need to be doing as, new, as older Christians. We need to be encouraging the new ones. They could have easily just said, well, he's born, you got him there, good luck. No, they made the point to come and just put their arms around me and my wife and hold my baby boy and tell me that, hey, 
you have family. And for some of you this morning, that looks like next steps. What is that? That looks like maybe giving your life to Christ. Finally surrendering to Christ. For some of you, it's about baptism or it might be serving and plugging in. That's why we have the next steps lunch. It's free food. And you get to hang out with Pastor Aaron and us. It's, we do it every month. If you've never been, I encourage you to go. And last but not least, a church on the move seeks God's presence by sending their best. As we're starting these neighborhood churches, as we're starting these neighborhood campuses, we don't just want to send the Joe Smo who's been here once or twice and really doesn't understand our family dynamic. We want to send those of you who have been leading Bible studies for the last 10 years to now go and help that church set up healthy Bible studies. We want to send you who have been top quality greeters to now go and be a smiling face of that new campus and show others how to smile. We got to send our best. Why? because ultimately God sent his. And as we transition into this time of communion, we have to understand, for some of us it might be the first time, that God, he could have done many different things. God could have honestly ended the story in Genesis chapter three when we screwed it up. But God sent his son, so that whomever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And if you'll bow your heads with me, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you that as a church on the move, as, as you're growing Indian Rocks and as you're developing leaders in this place, God, from the little to the big, from the boys to the girls, to the, to the men to the women, God, to moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, God, we need all of us to come together and be unified in your presence so that we can then go out into the darkness and be a steeple of light. So God, as we enter into this time of communion, I pray that we reflect. And for some, it's that last reflection before we finally jump all in. And for others, God, it's seeking that forgiveness and grace from you once more. So Lord, be with us in this time. Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray this all in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.